Yeah, good afternoon. You're welcome to the GHGA lecture series. So I'm happy to introduce our speaker, Professor Dr. Annette Pater. Um, she studied biology in tubing, it's great, like me. So we are fellow students and epidemiology at the Harvard School of Public Health. And after finishing her PhD at the LMU, she did her postdoctoral studies in epidemiology at the Harvard School of Public Health again, and later at the Helmholtz Center in Munich. And there she also started her first group leader position at the Institute of Epidemiology 2001. And Dr. Peters has been working on, I tried to find out what all the different topics were quite a lot, but uh, I found important was health effects of air pollution, then interaction of genetic and environmental factors, uh, epidemiology of chronic diseases, and also aging related morbidities or multi-morbidities. So a broad spectrum all with a focus on epidemiology. Uh, she's associate professor at the Department of Environmental Health of the Harvard School of Public Health, um, professor of epidemiology at the Institute of Medical Information Science Biometry and Epidemiology at the LMU in U Munich, and also director of the Institute of Epidemiology at the Helmholtz Center in Munich. So that must be a very busy schedule, I could imagine. So it's really great that you are here today to present your latest research at the GHG lecture series. The talk is about the German national cohort, overall study design and omics concept. And I'm very much looking forward to your talk and the floor is yours. Yeah, so many thanks for the invitation and the kind introduction. And indeed, I'm going to present uh, not so much research, but the German national cohort as an infrastructure and the concept behind because the German national cohort is actually now let's see yeah is a unique prospective cohort study and it's um, without anything comparable within Germany but we think also internationally it's a very it's going to be a very important uh, resource and I'm also very happy to, in the course of the talk, to explain how uh, DHGA will kind of in the future um, be important for NACO. So the NACO is, um, was designed as a German national cohort. It's a prospective population-based prospective cohort. And it was set out to be of use at least 30 years. We have been recruiting more than 200,000 men and women, and at the outside said we defined that we would include persons in the age between 20 and 69 years, and that we would use the mandatory population registries in Germany to, um, to recruit these people. And it's a joint endeavor um, funded by the Federal Ministry for Education and Research, the participating states, the Helmholtz Association. Um, and we are really a very large collaborative project, which includes many colleagues from the universities, from the Leibniz Centers and the Helmholtz Centers, as well as our other national organizations. And we have the objective to identify pathways linking lifestyle and environmental risk factors to disease, and especially also quantify whether these risk factors have still the same meaning today, or whether we can also identify novel risk factors. We want to understand the geographic and socioeconomic disparities in health and disease because we see quite large gradients um, between Germany. For example, the risk of becoming a diabetic is twice as high if you are from mecklenburg vorpommern compared to uh, southern Germany. And we want to develop risk prediction models for personalized prevention and evaluate markers and tools and evaluate and develop markers and tools for early detection of disease. And what makes the NASA special is that we do not focus on single diseases as other cohorts have to be have done in the past. For example, here in Munich, we work with the CORA cohort, which was initiated as a cardiovascular disease research um, tool. However, here in NACO, we really span across all diseases so that we can also look at really joint pathways and understand the early origins of multimorbidity. 
And this is just a picture showing indeed who is involved and how we spread across uh, the entire country. And um, we started in 2013 with a pilot and then the baseline examination, which we indeed recruited the 200,000 plus people, was done between 2014 and 19. And we are currently in the first re-examination and have planned um, a second re-examination as part of the current proposal. And we are following everybody who has um, participated in the cohort and still upholds his or her informed consent um, for incident events by questionnaires as well as secondary data lim images. And the whole um, cohort is accompanied by quality assessment, data processing, and then the use of the data. And so this is the cohort in numbers. Um, we have a standard examination, which we administered in more than 205,000 people. We have an in-depth examination, which was, were more than 57,000 uh, has to have received that. Actually, at the outline of the design, we have planned to do this in 40,000. But because we have luckily also a magnet resonance imaging protocol, we were able to um, recruit more people into this in-depth um, deep phenotyping exercise. And what may be also of interest uh, for the greater scientific community is that there can be additional auxiliary projects, which we call level three, uh, with external funding to answer questions which we could not place in the main project. And as I said before, we are uh, within the first re-examination and are aiming at re-examining 130,000 people. We have a unique biomaterial collection where we collect the blood specimens such as serum, plasma, buffy coats, and RNA, um, but also urine, saliva, and feces and nasal swabs. And we have a reduced set of parameters or, or biosamples, bio which we collect currently. And then the um, third component, which we are particularly proud of, is the magnet resonancing imaging um, component, which we conduct at five sites. And at the baseline examination, we had more than 30,000 examines. And currently, we are planning at re-examining 18,000 of those for a second time. And um, indeed, these are the same numbers, but now highlighting what we have achieved also now through the corona pandemic. So we have um, more than 70,000 examined by now, and also more than 10,000 repeat images collected. Um, so just give me, let me give you uh, a description of whom we, uh, what are we actually meaning by examination. So we take blood pressures, we take electrocardiograms, um, 3D uh, cardiography by ultrasound measurements. We do ankle brachial index and pulse wave analyses, which basically tell you how well the blood flow is throughout the extremities and can thereby um, also detect features of uh, evolving cardiovascular disease. And then we have devices. So we have a long-term ECG and the assessment of sleep characteristics by a device called Somnobot. If we move to other diseases for diabetes, we do an all-glucose tolerance test which is basically a challenge test, um, but which we could not administer in everybody. So we have around 20,000. Uh, and we do skin autofluorescence to see whether there are end products accumulating in the skin. Um, we do lung function measurements in everyone, um, which is quite a demanding procedure, but was very well implemented. And we do exhaled nitrate, nitrate oxide, which gives you um, a measure of the inflammatory responses of the lung. And um, you may know NO nitric oxide or nitrogen dioxide 
as pollutants, but you can also, so the NO is something we exhale as humans, and it's a sign of inflammation deep in the lungs. Then we um, have a number of things where we assess physical fitness and activity, of course, a very important determinant for health. So we have um, measures of good strength, which um, is a very good indicator uh, also for mortality actually later in life. Um, we do 24 hour accelerometry um, and we have upgraded the numbers there to really have more widespread information on actual physical activity measures. Um, and we uh, so we do this 24 hours and seven days, and then we have a sub study where we do um, bicycle ergometry to characterize the cardiovascular, cardiovascular and pulmonary fitness. Um, for the sensory system, we do um, a visual testing, and we do retinal photography, we do hearing tests, and olfactory uh, uh, so um, smell tests. Um, and we do neurological and psychiatric diseases where we assess the memory, language, and attention, as well as skills, motor skills, coordination, and attention. And so um, this is something which, again, in these numbers has not been present at all in Germany before. And then, of course, we need to know how, uh, how tall is our participants, how much they weigh, um, and then we also measure abdominal and vis visceral sex. And we um, count tooth and do oral examinations um, and is, uh, measure the musculoskeletal um, system, although that has actually turned out to be really difficult. And for some of these things, we're not so sure how good our data really will be. Um, so this was a food tour de force so through the measurements. We also asked, as epidemiologists love to do a lot of questions, both in a face-to-face -face interview as well as on um, on a touchscreen implement uh, instrument, and have really very widespread information as risk factors, but also novel things like um, uh, e-cigarette smoking. So here you see that we indeed managed to recruit as planned. So in the age range of from 20 to 40 years, we planned 20% of the cohorts and an equal distribution between men and women. And then the other 80% are distributed over three decades of ages and go from 40 to 69. Um, also, we succeeded to recruit uh, throughout the study centers as planned, and Augsburg and Brandenburg have our double study centers where we recruit, where we aim at 20,000. So that was a really a big success. And um, also for the in depth um, uh, examination, the level two, we complete, completed as planned. And you see here that especially those who had a magnet resonance imaging site, so MRI, they kind of needed to do more um, examinations or the more in-depth examination. You may notice that Blue North had not as many as the others MRI centers. And this is due to the fact that there, the uh, participants of the Lean Center and South were also invited to participate in the MRI program. And so um, we are very proud that we have quite complete data um, that we have um, for the level one examinations, nearly 94% who completed all modules. Um, and then you see that this is slightly lower for the level two examinations, but there the study centers were allowed to pick and choose of these um, examination tools. Um, finally, baseline recruitment, um, we have an overall response of 17%, which does not sound great, but was actually a major effort. And you see that there is substantial variability across the country. Also, there is um, a substantial variability across age ranges. So um, you see here that it was actually much easier to recruit people who are 
uh, six years and older, whereas the younger ones were really hard and females were more likely to participate than males. Um, and so with that in mind, we just briefly now go through certain important aspects of the study. This is the magnet, magnet resonance imaging subset, which was conducted in the four centers. And we have also four sites where imaging expertise was provided as part of the imaging core. We run uh, a 60 minute brain, heart, hip, spine, and test distribution protocol. We have um, identical uh, three Tesla and Sarah scanner at, at all sites and go and report on incidental findings um, uh, and have a thorough quality assurance. And so indeed there were people in whom we were, uh, we, uh, for example, detected tumors or had at least checkups for tumors as well as aneurysms and other potential harmful um, uh, incidental findings. This there is a centralized data management and an ongoing data abstraction. And we have um, ways of calls for this data and have just completed the first call for the 30,000 uh, samples. And here you see images, how this looks like. So a lot of opportunities for machine learning and indeed the newer applications, nearly all of them have some component of extracting data information from these images using um, machine learning techniques. And so this is maybe a very busy slide to say that in Germany, we do not can simply work with record linkage, as you may have heard from UK or from Scandinavian um, cohorts. So we actually need to ask everybody about diseases and then um, validate these findings. And in addition, where we can do record linkage. So for example, we have already um, 11 cancer registries on board. This is a component which is left out of the DCAC set and has been really successful. And we are doing a centralized mortality follow-up, which again is a ma major asset because normally you need to go state by state. And um, for example, just for our core study, we realized that we will not get death certificate from somebody who died in Bremen even though he, did, he or she gave consent without really context, context, contacting the um, uh, state um, representatives for data protection. So for NACO, this is much easier and better organized. And um, another um, very special feature is that we have a central biorepository. This is the building which stands here at Helmholtz Munich where we have highly innovative storage systems, implemented a semi-automated system at minus 80 degrees storage and a fully automated at minus 100 uh, degrees storage. And where there we store 73% of all natural samples. Um, and here you get an overview um, where what we store at the central biorepositories on the bottom line, you see the various specimens we are collecting, and we have um, 84 aliquots at max per person at the central biorepository of a total of 116. And so that makes 115.2 million, which have been stored already. And now for the first re examination, we'll go for 26 aliquots per participant, and for the future, we plan to um, uh, increase that again and maybe of relevance for the area you, you are interested in. We now will also be collecting RNA samples as part of the second re-examination. And indeed, this brings me to the omics uh, component of that. Um, of the um, German NATO um, or the German national cohort. It was kind of by design that the money was mainly invested or was completely invested into recruiting the people, into phenotyping them, and into storing biosamples. And so what we have is a lot of material to actually 
now move forward with Onyx. And when we were discussing how do we should we prioritize, the idea was that we would actually um, kind of in the concept say we should be genotyping and really also sequencing all participants. And then for the deep multi omic phenotyping, we would rather go for a selected set or start with a selected set and select those with the intensified program first. Um, and then also highlight that we have unique capabilities for microbiomics and virus to our sample. So that was, um, uh, and then of course, when we, we have developed um, an omics concept, and when you think of what is all desirable, you see this very long list of um, here, uh, not, ta not talking mainly about genetics, but for the future omics approaches. So we would like to look at epigenetics, um, both with array-based methods as well as through sequencing. Of course, in the transcriptomic areas, you would be interested to look at the various RNA species. For proteomics, there are now the, um, the O-Link um, proximity extension assay, as well as mass spectrometry, which are complicated methods, as well as multiplex high throughput approaches. Then for metabolomics, there are also various measures of um, uh, methods available. And um, again, here it's uh, the question whether you want to um, detect novel things, which nobody has seen before, or whether you are more in the realm of quantifying uh, and repeatedly assessing certain metabolites from blood, from urine, or we have also samples where this would be possible from feces. And then there is, of course, the whole world of microbiomics, which where uh, 16 R, uh, RNA um, sequencing, with 16 S RNA sequencing, as well as metagenomes, would be what one would like to go for. So, um, and just as a, I could not restrain from showing some data, so here at the center, we are live trying to link environmental exposures with health and feel that um, this is particularly important to understand epigenetic changes. And indeed, um, we this is a public this year's publication where based on CORA data, we looked at um, integrating the um, genetic variability with the CPG site and found a number of locations. Where the um, where there is actually a trend regulation happening, and when you then look at a particular um, um, gene uh, region, for example, you can um, uh, identify areas for, such as UBS3B, which is a target in phosphatase activity where there is, um, which has been identified as, as an early transcriptomic based biomarker of gestational calorie restriction and may drive program susceptibility to uh, obesity and other chronic diseases in life. And so you can now kind of um, interpret that and the NACO would allow to find more of these associations with the rich data set, but then also look prospectively what these changes really mean. And um, here we have uh, identified something which could be a potential mediator of both genetic and environmental exposure underlying adiposity, adiposity and cardiometabolic disease. So, so this is really the vision moving forward. However, Seth, when you when we negotiated now or between amongst the or, or developed the third funding phase, currently NACO is funded until next year. And so we want to of course move onward. It was clear that genotyping is an absolute essential. And um, I always say, well, genotyping is like smoking, you really need that data. However, um, we had to cut uh, costs, which gave, leaves us with genotyping and um, uh, virus antibodies. And so I probably do not need to tell that, of course, we want to look at polygenic risk scores. 
we want um, uh, we can thereby identify genetic gender, ethnicity, and relatedness. Identify susceptible subpopulation, have means for causal inference, and we also think that this is an asset for collaboration as well as partnerships with industry to potentially fund other on its level. And then we have also pledged for doing SARS-CoV-2 antibody screens in stored serum samples because we have measures before the pandemic and now throughout the pandemic and will be able to determine um, the role of SARS-CoV-2 infections as well as vaccine responses and to study long COVID. And uh, this is a slide showing you how complex the entire data management um, is. And I would like to draw, so it goes from the participant over the study centers, the um, central infrastructures to the transfer hub. And we have now also put in place um, an omics core with genotyping. And um, this, there will be a genomic data cloud, um, and luckily we could convince Oliver Stegler to, um, to be part of the design team for that, and so that we, um, we build, a, there will be a data sharing cloud for genotype and multi-omics data in the future. Um, and there, it was, there is an interface of this cloud with the data, NACO data infrastructures. And this will be also part of the data transfer. And luckily, um, we will be building upon the uh, GHCA um, infrastructurized ideas, which will link NAPO then to the European Gen Genome Phenome Archive. And so I think this is a major uh, step forward. And we got um, agreement to now preparing the farm and track so that we hope to to seamlessly move into that and being able to genotype as well as build up these infrastructure. Oops, the wrong direction. And no. Okay, and then we also build a GBAS data uh, analysis flow. And there we want to um, uh, provide standard workflows for processing the data, do QC, as well as um, uh, run a predetermined GMAS analysis. And another idea of Oliver, uh, which I think would be a major step forward, um, on the left hand side, you see that's what we're currently doing. We have the data use and access process. The data will be data download, and then the researcher will work on, it, on his or her own system. For the future, we think we should have a trusted research environment where there is, which is part of the data transfer unit, where there is data staging and a cloud-based trusted research environment, which the researcher can use to um, uh, <clears throat> to to enhance collaboration to. Democratize the NACO, the access to NACO, as well as be able to collaborate internationally. So that is currently not funding, but the concepts are there. And so we think it's important to really lobby for that and make that happen. Um, the, what, what is in place already and is available and accessible is the NACO Transfer Hub for data dictionary and study documents for data application provision tools and it's open currently for all the design. And so here is the data access principle. There is the we provide quality assured data. Um, and um, there is so you go, you apply for this data, it will be evaluated by the use and access committee. There is a data usage contract which also makes us compliant with all GDPR regulations and then data and samples are provided by the transfer unit and we are reintegration integrating the rise variables. And with that I'm at the end. Um, you see here that the various components I have been describing. We are large, we have repeated imaging and deep phenotyping, we record linkage, we have unique 
bio samples, and now moving into um, follow-up data and also corona analyses. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions.